All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. Welcome to our webinar, Cubeflow Pipelines On-Prem. I'm Vangelis Koukis, co-founder and CTO at Aricto. I'd like to thank everyone who's joining us today. A few housekeeping items before we start. During the webinar, you're not able to talk as an attendee. There's a QA box at the bottom of your screen. Please feel free to drop your questions in there and we'll get to as many as we can at the end. This session is being recorded. We will send it out afterwards along with a link to the presentation. So let's kick off today's presentation. Let me share my screen. Okay, you should be seeing my screen. You should be seeing the presentation. Kupflow pipelines on prem. What problem does Kubeflow try to solve? Setting up a whole ML platform, a full ML workflow is very hard. It's even harder to do it in production. It's even harder to do it across clouds in a multi-cloud environment where hardware changes, software changes, make it difficult to adapt. And when we're talking about multi-cloud, even if you're working on your laptop and then you're doing some part of your ML workflow on the cloud and some sort of a cloud provider, you're running a multi-cloud deployment. Your laptop is a cloud region. So how does Kubeflow help? Kubeflow containerizes ML components, so they run on Kubernetes, and then Kubernetes is the single platform that runs everywhere and allows you to run your workloads uniform. And people tend to think about an ML product, an ML workflow, as being concentrated around ML code, as being concentrated around the model and training. But in reality, actually writing the code is a very small piece of having an ML workflow up and running. You need to configure, you need to collect data, you need to verify your data, you need to manage your resources, your hardware resources, your software resources, you need to extract features, you need process, you need to serve separately in production. All of these things are essentially DevOps, ML ops, and someone has to handle them. So this is where Kubeflow comes into the picture. Why Kubeflow? Because it gives you an end-to-end -end solution to run ML as containerized components on Kubernetes. It allows you to experiment and uh, explore state-of-the-art AI. It's easy to onboard, especially if you use the package version like mini Kubeflow, the one we will be describing to you today. And it has outstanding community and industry support. What is mini Kubeflow? Mini Kubeflow is packaged Kubeflow created by us, uh, Aricto. We take the latest version of Kubeflow and package it in an all-in-one uh, way as a single node deployment. You run a single simple command and you have virtualized Kubernetes plus Kubeflow plus Aricto's rock data management software running on a single machine on your laptop. This is meant to make onboarding new users to Kubeflow as easy as possible. You essentially get yourself from nothing to uh, the Kubeflow dashboard within 10 minutes. Mini Kubeflow was the subject of last week's webinar. It has been recorded and you can find the link in this webinar's uh, presentation. So it's essentially a very easy way to spin up a single node deployment of Kubeflow so you can experiment with its full feature set. How do you install mini Kubeflow? You watch last week's recording, you read the docs, but the too long didn't read version is you initialize Vagrant with a box that we produce and then you start your machine. And then you'll be guided through the installation process and you'll have Kubeflow up and running within 10 minutes. For this webinar, we assume that you already have mini Kubeflow deployed, so we'll take it for granted. 
we're going to be doing a live demo. We're going to be running live the Chicago taxi cab example from Kubeflow on prem on your laptop on Mini Kubeflow. So, what exactly is the Chicago taxi cab example? The original data set for the example, it's a, it's a TFX example. It comes, uh, it was created for, for TFX and then it was adapted for Kubeflow. The original data set for the example is more than 100 million uh, taxi cab trips released by the city of Chicago as a public data set. And the fields for each trip are how much money the passengers spend and when the trip started, when the trip ended, uh, where the trip started, pick up coordinates, where the trip ended, drop off coordinates, uh, how long the trip was, uh, what means of payment the passenger used, and what the tip was. So the end result of the example is a trained model, a classifier, that will be able to predict whether a trip will result in a tip that's more or less than 20% the fare. So that's the uh, purpose of this example. Okay, and what's our demo going to be like? We'll start from a notebook managed by Kubeflow. We'll be attaching a data volume, an empty data volume to this notebook. This volume will be managed by RAC, our data management software. Uh, we assume you're running on-prem, so you'll be using some sort of local storage technology, more on this later on. Then we will bring uh, some uh, data, the data set into this volume, presumably from some external data source. Then we will snapshot this volume and we will use this snapshot that is immutable. It no longer changes as the volume continues to evolve as you continue to work on your data. We will snapshot this volume and seed a Kubeflow pipeline from this snapshot. So, and that's the cornerstone of the presentation. While you continue, you and your colleagues continue to work on the volume or on the volumes, you can instantiate pipelines from snapshots of said volumes. And this is very close to what you do with Git and code. Same way you can Git commit and then take a Git snapshot and have this be a production version of your software while you continue developing new features. You can commit your data. You can produce data commits that no longer change and have a single immutable ID. And you can, snap, you can see pipelines from this immutable data. So after a while, after a few months, for example, when you actually have a trained model and you want to go back to the data that produced this model because there's some bias in this model, for example, you can recreate the actual data that was used to train the model you can attach it as a clone to a notebook and you can explore. And you can actually do it for each individual step of the pipeline, more on this later on. So let's get started. First step, create the notebook and add a data volume. So I'm switching over to a secondary desktop. This is where mini Kubeflow runs. We see it's already been deployed. We have our credentials. We can open the Kubeflow dashboard, go to notebooks. I don't have any notebooks server yet, servers yet. Uh, this is a new uh, Kubernetes native UI that Arikto contributed to Kubeflow 0.5, creating a new server. I'll name my notebook TaxiCab1, and I'm gonna be adding, I already have a volume for my home folder for my workspace, this is where I keep my libraries. And I'll create a new volume. I'll call it, I don't know, data. And this is where I'll, uh, I'll use it as a data volume for my experiment. I'll set its size, let's say smallish volume, spawning the notebook. So this creates a, no a new notebook server this amount of CPU, this much memory, as a new pod on Kubernetes. So I'm using Kubeflow's notebooks as a service uh, component, essentially. So my TaxiCab one notebook server 
has been deployed, it's running, I can now connect it. So I'm connecting to it, and this is my uh, standard JupyterLab environment. So I already have my data folder. This is my data volume. This is where I'll be placing my data as I uh, explore. I start a terminal. I will make the terminal font a bit bigger so you can see. Let me increase it a bit. Okay, I think that's legible. So at this point, I've created my notebook and I have my data volume that is empty. So I have my empty data volume here. This is it. Okay, back to the presentation. Now I'm gonna be ingesting data into this volume from an external source wherever my uh, data lives uh, in an archived form. And I am also going to compile the TaxiCab pipeline from its Python source. So first step is cloning the Kubeflow pipelines repository. That's where we'll be getting our data. These are pipelines examples, so I'll be using the data that comes with uh, the Kubeflow pipelines repository. And this data sits somewhere here. And I'm gonna be copying this data into my data volume. So this is essentially a data ingestion step. I'm using whatever method I need to use. It could be a download from a data lake. It could be, I don't know, streaming data that comes in from an external source that I'm storing into my data volume. So this copied the data I'll use into my data volume. Okay. And then I also need to compile my pipeline. So for this, I'll use my cheat sheet here to get the command to download the source of the pipeline. That's the source of the pipeline. Let's take a look into the pipeline. So a cook for pipeline is Python source that defines individual steps of the pipeline in Python. Steps are container operations. They run using a container image. They take input and output data. And Kubeflow pipelines will orchestrate pods in which these container operations will run on Kubernetes. And that's, uh, that this is what we're gonna be seeing later on. So this is the source of our pipeline. And it's using uh, our data volume, local volume uh, operations. Our volume is mounted here. So every step essentially uses this directory to input and output data. Okay, so I'm now compiling our pipeline. Compiling the pipeline produces a packaged form that I can then upload to the Kubeflow pipeline dashboard and start the pipeline. Okay, so I compiled the pipeline. This is the compiled form. And it should also appear here at some point, here it is. So, so this is the compiled form of our pipeline. Now, uh, it's not yet in Pipeline's master, I think, but there will be a command line interface to actually upload the compiled pipeline to the dashboard from within the notebook. But right now, I'm gonna just download it. So I have it on my local machine, so I can then upload it to the dashboard. So what have I done so far? And here's the download the pipeline. So what have I done so far? I have ingested data into the data volume and I have compiled the Taxica pipeline. So next step is I'll be using Rock to snapshot this volume to produce an immutable snapshot, a data commit from which I will then start the pipeline I just compiled. 
So as I continue to work on the notebook, as my colleagues continue to work on this volume, training will start and will continue from a snapshot of this data. So no matter what changes I or my colleagues do, they're not gonna be impacting the training process within the pipeline. So to snapshot the volume, I'm going to rock. This is rock. I'll be creating a new budget to hold my snapshot. Let's call it taxi tab one. That's my new budget. I will snapshot my full environment. So I will snapshot my running Jupyter Lab, the one I just created. And because it's a data commit, I can provide a title and a message. So when I see it after some time, I know exactly what I have done. So it's gonna be my initial commit, let's say, ingested data. Uh, compile pipeline, ready to start a run. Okay, I'm starting the snapshot. So snapshotting is essentially a task that has two parts. Snapshotting the full lab means snapshotting my workspace, my home folder, and my data volume. So I know exactly what libraries I had installed in my notebook and exactly what data I had created in my notebook. I can snapshot them individually or I can snapshot them as a whole, as I'm doing now, to have a snapshot of my full lab. So I've now snapshotted my full lab. And if I go to files, I can see my full snapshot. My lab has a data snapshot and a workspace snapshot and my snapshots are versioned. This has a single version, my initial commit. It can have more versions later on. So going back to files, I'm copying a link to the data snapshot so I can have it uh, for later. So at this point, I have snapshotted my full lab into a snapshot on rock. And I have taken, I have copied a link to the data snapshot that I will be using to see the pipeline. Okay, next step is actually starting the run. So going back to food flow, pipelines. This is food flow pipelines. I will be uploading a new pipeline, upload a file. I'll choose my downloaded pipeline, the one I just compiled, call it Taxicab1. It's been uploaded, here it is. Okay. This is the pipeline. This is exactly actually what we will be doing. These are the pipeline steps. Every step has dependencies. So this step has inputs that come from this step and produces outputs that are consumed by this and this and this and this step and so on. So I'm now gonna create a new experiment. Let's call it Taxicab experiment one. And I'm going to create a new run inside this experiment. So it's gonna be Taxicab run one. Okay. And you'll notice that one of the parameters is a rock URL. So we have modified this pipeline. So it accepts a link to the data volume as a parameter. So when this pipeline runs, we know the exact snapshot it started from. So we can recreate its results whenever we like. So I'm giving it the link to rock that I copied before. This is pretty complicated, but that's what's of interest to you. Okay. And I'm starting the pipeline. So this is a new run of the pipeline. And I'm now seeing the live graph. Previously, I was, I was uh, seeing a static graph of what the pipeline would be. 
I'm now seeing the live graph of what the pipeline is currently doing. So the create volume step is complete, and now the validation step is running. So what exactly is the create volume step? The very first step of the pipeline is to look at the pipeline code, is to create a new volume as a clone of the snapshot URL that I gave the pipeline. So the pipeline needs to work with live data, with mutable data. So the very first step of the pipeline is to clone the snapshot and start and be seeded from the data I had initially ingested in the notebook. So I'm now seeding this pipeline from whatever I had put in the data volume from within my notebook. And now the validation step is running and then all the other steps will run uh, as uh, steps complete. So uh, this takes about 10 minutes more or less. Let's go back to the presentation. So what exactly do these steps mean? This is a figure from the TFX paper by Google. And the focus of the TFX paper was this part here. And for each one of the parts, data analysis, transformation, validation, training, evaluation, and serving, Google has open sourced the relevant TFX libraries. So this example, the steps of this example essentially correspond one to one with these libraries. Validation is using the TensorFlow data validation library to produce a, a schema of the data. Transformation uh, uses the TF transform library. Training happens with estimators. Serving happens with your serving. So Kubeflow gives you containerized, a containerized way to run these steps as part of a pipeline. Okay. And then Kubeflow also gives you an integrated front end to manage these jobs. So you saw there's a notebook component, there's a pipeline dashboard that you can use to upload your pipelines and watch their execution. Kubernetes stands in for the shared configuration and orchestration framework. So whatever the pipeline runs is essentially scheduled as pods on Kubernetes. And then there's this big, these two big white boxes here that talk about garbage collection, data access controls, and pipeline storage. And in mini Kubeflow, and the, way, the reason why Arikto wants to, is integrating with a Kubeflow is because we provide the pipeline storage component. So this pipeline runs over data volumes backed by ROG, our data management software, on-prem. So we stand in for the pipeline storage component of this feature. What do the steps do? Let's go back to the pipeline. So the validation step has completed, the pre-processing step has completed. You'll see that all of the steps depend on the create volume step. Why? Because all of the steps essentially manipulate data on the newly created data volume. What's of interest is that same way we created the volume as a clone of a snapshot, we can have steps that snapshot the volume. And when should we have these steps? Exactly after uh, pipeline steps have completed. More on this later on. So we're now running the training component. The training component will get the schema, get the pre-processed data. It will find all of these things inside the volume and train our model. So data validation, uh, the example uses the TensorFlow data validation library to validate the data and generate the data set schema. Pre-processing, transform the data into TF records. Model training, model training is running now. It trains the model using the processed data set and produces a saved model that will then be used to uh, infer predictions. And then we have analysis that will evaluate the model and a prediction step that will generate predictions, will produce results as CSV files and will then produce uh, raw curves and, uh, confusion matrix, and the confusion matrix. So this seems to be running. Why does it matter to have a local Kubeflow deployment? because you can have a unified user experience. We are running on-prem, we're running on our laptop, 
but we're still using the same APIs we can use anywhere else Kubeflow is deployed. We use notebooks, we use the Kubeflow pipelines dashboard, we can use pairing to convert notebooks into uh, TensorFlow jobs. We have all the, we have all the APIs, all the Kubernetes uh, definitions that we need to program in the same way, whether we are on-prem or on the cloud. But what about data management? How do we handle our data in a multi-cloud scenario? So this is where Rock comes into the picture. We have extended Kubeflow to use persistent volumes in a vendor agnostic way. So each Kubeflow component uses persistent volumes to get its data. This has been our contribution to Kubeflow. And then we have contributed initially a Jupyter Hub-based spawner for notebooks with support for persistent volumes in 0.4, the uh, earlier, excuse me, version of Kubeflow. We have now contributed a Kubernetes native notebook manager with support for persistent volumes, the one that's just so being used to create the notebooks. And we have contributed extensions to the uh, domain specific language of pipelines, essentially the Python syntax of Kubeflow pipelines. So you can very easily create volumes and snapshots to manipulate your data inside the Kubeflow pipeline. And this is what backs the create volume step of our pipeline here. So training is done, by the way, and then the prediction step and the deployment step of the model and the analysis step, they all depended on the training steps, so they're all done. The confusion matrix is done. The rock curve has been created. The pipeline run uh, successfully. And the pipeline, let me go to runs. The pipeline produces certain metrics that are the result of training. So I was able to run the pipeline on mini flow on prem successfully using a clone of the data I snapshotted from within my notebook. So why is it important to have data management with Kubeflow? Using data management alongside Kubeflow allows you to version, package, and share your data. The snapshot I created of the data volume from within the notebook is a version, an immutable version of the data. It never changes. I can now produce a new version with newly added data, and I will always be able to tell those two versions apart. So I can rerun the pipeline with a new version of the data, and I can then compare the results of the pipelines and actually uh, correlate them to the input data. So how do we do that? And we also allow you to share these snapshots, these data versions across environments. So you can snapshot in one location, synchronize these snapshots to other locations, and clone these snapshots into new data volumes so you can start new pipelines in different locations. So you have one location or one environment for experimentation. This can be your laptop. You have one environment for training. This can be Google Cloud, where you'll be training on GPUs, for example, for scale. You have one environment where for production, presumably you run inference here. So Kubeflow is data aware, uses PVCs as Kubernetes primitives everywhere. PVCs is persistent volumes. We use an interface called CSI to integrate with Kubernetes. Our software sits on the side of whatever storage you have. So the volumes we saw were backed by local SSDs, local NVMe SSD. So they're as fast as possible. And then our software sits on the side and manipulates the data on these SSDs. It snapshots this data, keeps them for long-term archival, and synchronizes them from location to location. So why is this important? Because each pipeline step essentially runs on a virtual volume. The volume starts from a snapshot, and you can also snapshot the results of each step and why do that? Because for each individual step, you have a snapshot of how it started and where it ended up. So this is a pretty complicated pipeline, right? And let's say that the deployment step failed. Okay, now what? Now the input to this step can be a snapshot 
of the output of the training step. So I can clone the, uh, this snapshot and attach it to a new notebook and explore. And then because you use snapshots to keep the state, the output of each individual step, if this pipeline runs on one location and we use an object store for long-term archival of your virtual snapshots, you can be running hybrid pipelines by taking the output of step three here and feeding it as input to step four, we can run step one, two, and three of a pipeline in one location, location one, and step four, five, and six of the same pipeline in location two by essentially splitting it into two pipelines and getting the output of the first pipeline as a snapshot to become the input of the second pipeline. And this is how you can also reproduce pipelines by essentially getting the snapshot that was fed to the original pipeline's input and rerunning it. So before Moon Kubeflow and before Rock, to work with data on-prem, you need to be familiar with kube control and understand Kubernetes primitives and compose YAML files to manipulate your PVCs and create these PVCs manually and fill them with data. What you saw is that we created data volumes over a user interface. We used drug to snapshot the environment and we fed the snapshot into the pipeline. The number of steps you need to run a similar pipeline is uh, quite big. You have to use good control and submit quite a few demo files to create the PVCs and fill them with data. So by uh, using Minikubeflow and Rock, you essentially have quite less interaction with Kubernetes and YAML. You can move data fast from notebooks to pipelines and vice versa. It's easy to mount these, notebook, these uh, PVCs onto notebooks. Your pipelines are reproducible. No matter what happens to your data after you've started the pipeline, you can rerun the pipeline with the exact same input data. And by having per step snapshots, you can essentially explore and iterate and troubleshoot steps using notebooks. So everybody's happy. Now, what are future improvements we want to implement in MiniCubeflow? We want to implement GPU support so we can train using local GPUs. We want to extend this to multi-cloud and hybrid cloud pipelines. Uh, you saw the figure earlier. Uh, we will be integrating uh, the upcoming version Kubeflow 0.6 and packaging it uh, as a new version of Kubeflow. Integrating a volume manager UI so you can mount your volumes and uh, browse them graphically. If you want to give us feedback, if you try out mini Kubeflow, if you want to ask for new features, please join the Kubeflow Slack, the uh, hash mini Kubeflow channel. Uh, there's also going to be a survey after this webinar. You'll be presented with a, a survey that we have prepared. Please fill in the survey. We want to learn more about what your needs are, what you expect from Kubeflow, what you'd like uh, to be supported, what functionality you need, what's important for your work. We want to know more about uh, how you work and your uh, ML needs. Please try out mini Kubeflow. Uh, installation instructions are here or in the Kubeflow docs. Uh, it's essentially very easy to, to set it up to background commands as we, as we showed. And then 10 minutes after that, you have a full working environment. Uh, again, we need your feedback. Please fill in the survey you'll be presented with after this webinar. And um, thanks. Thank you for your attention. I think we have uh, some time for questions. Let me stop sharing my screen. So, uh, I'm reading the questions. I have, a, I have a question related to starting mini Kubeflow. Vagrant app is the only command that I need to start mini Kubeflow every time that my computer is restarted, right? Yes. Uh, you, when you shut down your computer, you, you change into the directory you have where mini Kubeflow is installed. You vagrant up the machine. You go to the uh, graphical user interface that mini Kubeflow uh, presents you with, which is this one. You click through the um, 
start script and the start script makes sure that all the components are up and running. Um, okay, next question. Is the code for the example available? Yes, the code for the example is available. We will be releasing this uh, presentation um, after the webinar. We have released as a blog post the full uh, walkthrough of this example. So you can go to the uh, Kubeflow blog and uh, read the full description of this example and run it yourself. How can I test this functionality? Is Rock included in Mini Kubeflow? Yes, Rock is included in Mini Kubeflow. Uh, what you saw is a, 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 a pristine deployment of Mini Kubeflow, Vagrant app, that's it. Is it free of charge? Rock included with Mini Kubeflow is free of charge. It comes with a single node license, so you can run it as part of Mini Kubeflow. Can I test this functionality on prem other than my laptop or on the cloud? Um, Mini Kubeflow is meant as a very simple, quick way to onboard new, um, new users to Kubeflow. It's not meant as a multi-node production environment, but we are definitely deploying Kubeflow and Rock uh, with collaborators, with customers, both on-prem and on the cloud. So please feel free to uh, get in touch and uh, we can uh, continue from there. Is Python the only language available inside Kubeflow? What about other languages like R or Scala? Um, the current example uses uh, Python inside the Jupyter Lab, but uh, my understanding is that Jupyter Notebooks uh, support many different languages and you can use your favorite language within the uh, notebook environment. I'm not sure. There is no language that is available inside Kubeflow in the sense that Kubeflow is a set of uh, multiple components. The Kubeflow pipelines language, the pipelines domain specific language is based on Python. So if you want to write a pipeline uh, using source code, you will be uh, constructing your pipeline in Python. Can I pre-populate notebooks instead of pulling from GitHub? Uh, yes. Uh, you, you saw that I snapshotted my notebook into a snapshot on Rock. So the nice thing is, and I can actually, uh, I can actually show this to you. Let me share my screen. So, um, if you go here, you will see that I can copy the link to my full snapshot. And then if I go to my notebooks and I create a new notebook server, there is a rock URL uh, setting here. So if I input this URL, I can essentially pre-fill this form and I can create a new notebook server that will be a snapshot of my old notebook server. So I can essentially clone my old environment. So it will be pre-populated with whatever data I had, both in my workspace volume, because we'll see my workspace volume is now a clone of an existing volume and in, of an existing snapshot, sorry, and my data volume. So back to questions. Um, how do I manage RAC? Uh, is it API driven? Yes, Rock uses an API. Uh, everything you, you see on the user interface is uh, driven via an API. Everything is orchestrated via API calls. That's how we were able to integrate Rock into pipelines. We, um, we have written a CSI plugin for Kubernetes that uses Rock API calls to orchestrate snapshotting and cloning. Uh, to do data management. So everything is API driven and you can orchestrate it programmatically. Uh, how do I deploy a pipeline in another environment, the G production? Uh, do I need to upload the compiled pipeline into the new Kubeflow? Uh, yes, yes. So uh, Kubeflow pipelines has its own API. You can access it programmatically. Uh, presumably these two environments, production and training will be different environments and they won't trust one another. So they'll have a different database, for example, to hold the uploaded pipelines. 
So you would need to upload your pipeline into the new environment. And Rock can help you in that, in the sense that if you want to run a serving pipeline in another environment, you can get the trained model as the output of a training pipeline in a training location and feed it as input to your serving pipeline. So you will essentially be doing you'll essentially be doing where was it? This. If this is your training pipeline, you can snapshot the output of your training pipeline, the trained model, which is immutable now. You know exactly what it, the, the contents of the trained model are. And Rock will synchronize this snapshot from location to location so you can spin up your serving pipeline in another location and have it use the trained model as input. Okay. So more questions. Um, is each step in your pipeline a container itself? Yes. Uh, if you saw the code of, uh, if you look at the source of the uh, pipeline, it defines container ops. Uh, so container ops are steps that are executed inside distinct containers. So Kubeflow pipelines orchestrates, it actually uses another orchestrate, orchestrator underneath called Argo. So Argo orchestrates containers, pods on Kubernetes for each individual step and then watches uh, these containers. And when they're done, it spin ups the containers that depended on their output and so on and so forth. So, so this is how you saw the uh, dynamic graph of the pipeline evolving as the pipeline was running. Um, Uh, can I give the rock URL to a data volume of a notebook? Yes, uh, we actually showed this. You can get the uh, rock URL that I had copied and you can use it in the notebook manager to essentially mount the snapshot as a new volume inside a notebook. So uh, whenever you have a data set and you can refer to it on rock, you can see the pipelines from it, you can start notebooks from it, you can sync it to other locations, Essentially, it's a data commit, and you can be referring to it uh, any way you like. Um, is there a concept of teams? So by default, anyone in the team has access to the volumes of other members of the team. Um, yes, uh, snapshots are organized in buckets. Buckets belong to users. Users uh, can uh, use a shared service that I did show today called the RAT registry essentially create sharing uh, relationships among buckets. So they can be sharing their buckets with other users. They can see who they're sharing with and they can include or exclude users from their access control lists. This essentially means that whenever you snapshot in one location and you introduce a new snapshot into a bucket, all the other users, they'll see their buckets being updated with the new data that you produced. And this is how you can essentially take the output of a pipeline in one location and feed it to input to a pipeline in another location. Um, where do you store the snapshots? The actual volumes live on primary storage. In this deployment, they live on local disks on local NVMe. They're as fast as it can get, minimal latency. The long-term archival of the snapshots, you can have hundreds of snapshots potentially, is done on some sort of local object store. So if you're running Rock on a cloud provider, we use the object storage service of whatever cloud provider you use. If you're on Amazon, you use S3. If you're on uh, GCP, on the Google Cloud, we use Google Cloud Storage. Uh, Mini Kubeflow uses a local object store for exactly this purpose. At what level does uh, Rock work? It works at the uh, file system and uh, block storage level. So we give you uh, virtual disks. We give you virtual disks, they have a file system on them, and we mount these disks on your notebooks. That's why I was able to uh, change into the data directory and list its contents. And that was also, and that's why we had to create a new clone volume to start the pipeline. So this volume was mounted on each container that was a pipeline step. So all the uh, pipeline steps worked on this virtual volume. Uh, can I snapshot only the data volume instead of snapshotting the whole lab? Yes. 
you can uh, I can actually show this. So uh, let me. So I'm snapshotting, snapshot a whole lab. In this case, I choose uh, my Jupyter lab or snapshot a single data set, which means I'm using, um, I'm picking up specific uh, persistent volumes on Kubernetes essentially, because data sets are persistent volumes on Kubernetes. And I can actually see where each persistent volume is mounted. So I may just snapshot my data volume that's mounted as home in Jovian data in my running notebook. Okay. Um, more questions. Uh, I see there's some questions in our chat box. So can I use Jupyter Lab as a multi-user? I have only two GPUs, four CPUs. Would like each session to use only one of these? Yes. When you, if you look at the uh, notebook manager, you can choose the number of CPUs as a fractional component as well that the uh, new notebook server will be using. Uh, you can also instruct it. There's a there's an extra options box where you can specify, oh, I need to also allocate one GPU. So these resources that you ask for will be allocated to your notebook server. They won't be available for use by other notebook servers. So um, you can get essentially, you can allocate a fraction of the CPUs and the GPUs so you can uh, use it yourself. And if you, if you go over your number of CPUs, for example, then at some point your notebook servers will become unschedulable because the system won't be able to satisfy your requirements. But you can definitely uh, share, and that's uh, the whole point of Kupler, right? That you can have self-service you know, notebooks on a shared, uh, very strong uh, GPU-enabled infrastructure. Um, okay, that's a nice question. Is there some sort of diff, at least a way of finding out what has changed at the file level? Yes. Uh, so because every version is named independently, you can mount both versions as two distinct volumes and you can run diff or rsync or, or whatever graphical diff uh, between the versions that you like depending on the kind of data that you have stored. And we're actually working on a different tools ourselves, on a graphical different tool. Is there integration with repos like GitHub, Codecommit? I'm not sure I understand this question. So if you're inside your notebook, you can clone whatever repository you like, you can fetch whatever uh, rep uh, data from whatever repository you like, and you can then snapshot this uh, information locally. Uh, is Rack a part of Kubeflow or a separate install? Rack is not a, a, a core component of Kubeflow. It's a separate data management software that you install separately. Uh, in mini Kubeflow, they're installed together, but Rack is a separate piece of software that integrates with Kubernetes and is integrated with Kubeflow. So you essentially instruct Kubeflow to use Rack via what's called a Kubernetes storage class. So Rack essentially exposes a storage class for the persistent volumes on Kubernetes, and you don't really have to use it with Kubeflow. You can use it with any other kind of stateful application you may be running on Kubernetes. You can run whatever other stateful application you want to run on Kubernetes and have it use uh, rock managed uh, persistent volumes. Uh, how about scheduling interactive and batch jobs for multi-users on-prem? Um, so interactive jobs is essentially notebooks, right? When you schedule your, uh, when you ask for the creation of new notebook servers, Kubeflow, uh, Kubernetes actually will schedule your notebook on whatever physical node it can find that can satisfy your requirements. So in this sense, you have, you gain scheduling from Kubernetes. Uh, batch jobs, uh, you can run uh, Kubernetes jobs directly, which are kind of low level, or you can run Kubeflow pipelines, and then Kubernetes will schedule individual pods in your running pipeline as uh, on distinct physical nodes of your cluster. So yes, you have scheduling, and this comes as part of Kubernetes. Kubeflow essentially uh, uses Kubernetes for scheduling pods. Uh, 
can I easily move between can I easily move data between environments, experiment, uh, training, or sharing data? Yes, we didn't show this functionality today. It will be part of uh, an upcoming webinar. You can instruct the way you can share data using RAC is you publish your buckets to the registry from one location, you subscribe to these buckets on another location or multiple locations, and then the data will flow up across locations in a point-to-point, peer-to-peer way, peer-to-peer way without crossing the registry, and it will use whatever links connect your locations. So essentially, uh, they form a peer-to-peer network and they will um, uh, exchange your data over encrypted TLS encrypted links. So your cloud uh, regions will communicate to one another and with your laptop if you are actually sharing data with your laptop to recreate your snapshots on all locations. Uh, so GPU support is not available now as it is available in, in Kubernetes. Um, Mini Kubeflow itself does not support GPUs right now. You can run, if you deploy Kubeflow on bare metal directly, you can spin up uh, GPU enabled notebooks. And of course, we'd be happy to help you deploy Kubeflow on prem or on the cloud and uh, run through GPU support. I'm most interested in GPU support and data sharing between environments. Yes, I think we have this covered. Um, uh, some comments. Uh, do you have PyTorch related examples? Um, yes, but this presentation uses the uh, uh, this example that used TensorFlow. Uh, I see the presentation is too Google oriented. Well, <laughs> this is interesting because this presentation actually showed how to deploy Kubeflow and run a full Kubeflow pipeline without using any. Um, Google specific infrastructure, right? Because Google is a big part of the Kubeflow community. Lots of software gets uh, developed and tested on GCP at first, but mini Kubeflow is essentially a proof of concept for running Kubeflow on-prem using on-prem resources, data volumes, for example, without depending on GCP specific resources. Um, uh, how do I schedule jobs? Um, so I'm, I don't have a precise answer for this. Um, there is a uh, Kubeflow Pipelines API that you can use to upload and run uh, pipelines programmatically. So this may be answering your question. I'm not, I'm not right now familiar with a way to say, uh, schedule this in a calendar-like way and have it run and have it run with certain triggers, but I'm sure it's, um, it's easy to write this kind of orchestration that would uh, essentially trigger execution of a pipeline run based on some sort of external trigger. So for example, Rock has triggers whenever you create a new snapshot. So you can uh, write some sort of uh, uh, thin glue code that would trigger a new pipeline run whenever you snapshot it something on Rock, for example. But that's just an example. Okay, so thank you for your attention. Uh, I think, yes. We are out of time. Um, thanks for joining us. In the coming days, we'll send you a recording of the webinar along with the slides and the, the links that point to uh, the previous webinar and the survey and so on. Stay tuned for our next webinars. Thank you for your attention and have a nice day.